Hello, this is our lec uh, lecture for lesson four regarding ocean sediments. First we'll start with defining what sediments are. Sediments are particles of organic or inorganic matter that are in uh, unconsolidated form. So that means they're loose materials. So we interact with sediment on almost a daily basis whether it be sand or um, or dirt or like, like mud or any other loose form of uh, organic or inorganic materials. So sediment can range in size, so very large pieces of sediment like boulders uh, to very tiny pieces of sediment such as little uh, particles of clay. Here's an example of uh, some uh, sediments on the mid-ocean ridge. You can see these white sediments deposited on the rock here. Now, sediments come in all different colors uh, depending on the type of sediment it is. It has different colors. So biological sediment, sediments coming from organisms, tend to be white or cream in color. Silica sediments grayish in color and uh, some sediments can be uh, reddish or browned. Brown, these are deep sea or red clays. Different parts of the ocean floor um, accumulate sediments at various rates. And so most of the ocean floor is accumulating some sediment. In some places, sediments can accumulate as fast as a few centimeters per year, while at other locations in the ocean, sediment accumulation can occur as, uh, as slow as thickness of a dime, which is about a millimeter every 1,000 years. Pretty slow. And so sediment deposition, due to these different uh, depositional rates, can be either sometimes very thick and sometimes very thin. So for example, if we look at this photo up here in the top right again, it's this very thin layer of sediment deposited on the mid-ocean ridge, where this is a seismic profile of a continental rise. And so this is the continental slope coming down here and piled up on the continental slope is all these sediments. And each of these lines has a different horizon of sediments. And so these sediments here are a little over a mile thick. Okay, so here are very thickly piled sediments in some locations, very thinly piled sediments in others. And we'll talk about where we tend to find thick depositions of sediments and where we find thin depositions of sediments. So some areas of the seafloor are actually free of sediment completely, and this can occur whenever there's strong enough currents to carry the sediment away so that it doesn't accumulate, or maybe the seafloor is too young, it just formed, and so no sediment has accumulated yet. Or there could be hot water coming up from uh, volcanic vents or deep sea vents, and that hot water can dissolve that sediment back into the water so that it cannot accumulate on the seafloor. So one way that we classify sediment is by the particle size. So here we have a table of uh, different types of particles. So we have from biggest to smallest, we have boulders, cobbles, pebbles, granules, sand, silt, and clay. I have sand, silt, and clay in this red rectangle because these are the three most common types of uh, particles found on the ocean floor. So sand. Uh, ranges between 0 0.062 to 2 millimeters in diameter, silt 0 0.004 to 0 0.062 millimeters in diameter, and clay is less than 0 0.004 millimeters. So pretty small, especially ca uh, clay. And if you'll notice that the settling velocity of this these particles in still water, it decreases as the size of the particle decreases. So the larger the particle, say for sand, the faster it settles in still water. So for example, sand will settle, it will sink, in other words, at 2.5 centimeters per second or roughly one inch per second in still water, while sit, silt uh, settles at much slower rate, 0 0.025 centimeters per second or one one hundredth of an inch per second. And um, or clay, 0.0025 centimeters per second, 
or that is one one thousandth of an inch per second. So the reason why this is, is because larger particles can more easily move water molecules out of the way and then sink down through the water. Our smaller particles have a harder time moving water molecules out of the way. And they, uh, as they become smaller and smaller, these uh, particles of sediment actually begin to interact with the water at a molecular level where the little tiny particles of clay are bouncing off of water molecules trying to fall down in between them. And so the larger the sediment is, the more easily you can just force those water molecules out of the way and sink down through them. While the smaller the sediment is in size, the harder time it has doing that. And so there's more resistance uh, to its downward motion by the water molecules, so it descends or settles at a slower rate. And finally, in this far right column, you see the time it takes to settle in four kilometers or two and a half miles of water. So at these settling rates, sand will settle in four kilometer deep water in about 1.8 days. Silt, six months, and clay take around 50 years. It's pretty crazy if you think about it. 50 years for clay to settle to the bottom of the sea floor. So sediments uh, can be classified by size, but they also can be classified by source. And this is the most common uh, way that we have of classifying sediments. So we have four different main types of sediment. We have pterogenous, biogenous, hydrogenous, which is sometimes called orthogenic, and uh, finally cosmogenous sediment. We're going to talk about each one of these. First, we have pterogenous sediment. Pterogenous sediment is the most abundant type of sediment found in the sea floor. Um, it originates from the erosion of continents, uh, island arcs, volcanic islands. And so pterogenous sediment is basically particles or pieces of rock. Okay, so this is boulders, cobbles, sand, clay, so forth. So uh, there's around 15 billion metric tons of pterogenous sediment transported into the ocean by water, and around 10 million metric tons transported into the ocean by wind. And so once again, pterogenous sediment is that sediment that's derived from land, and it is the most abundant type of sediment on the sea floor. Next we have biogenous sediment. Biogenous sediment is the second most abundant type of sediment on the sea floor. And there's uh, two main groups of biogenous sediment. There's siliceous, which is silicon containing, and calcareous, which is calcium carbonate containing sediments. And so the source of these sediments are these little tiny plants and animals that live in the uh, surface, just in the surface level of the water. And they make these little tiny protective shells and exoskeletons um, out of these materials, uh, silica or calcium carbonate. And whenever they die, these little tiny structures, as you see in these images down here, on this on the left, these are little uh, structures that these organisms make. These are calcium carbonate. And over here on the right, these are made out of silica. As they die, these little tiny structures, they settle to the seafloor and accumulate, forming what's known as biogenous oozes. And we'll talk more about them later. So biogenous sediment, though it's the second most abundant type of sediment, it covers the majority of the seafloor. Okay, so the, the largest portion of the surface area of the seafloor is covered by biogenous sediment, even though pterogenous sediment is the most abundant type of sediment. Next we have hydrogenous sediment. These are sediments that precipitate directly out of seawater. So you have dissolved minerals in water that precipitate out and form solids and those are what we call hydrogenous sediments. And so those dissolved minerals, which are dissolved rock, uh, those they, they come from uh, submerged rock being dissolved by water or newly formed crust being warmed more readily dissolved by water or volcanic vents could dissolve rock and those that dissolved rock and later precipitate out forming hydrogenous sediments. And some examples of hydrogenous sediments are these things called manganese nodules which form on deep sea beds and 
phosphorite nodules, which form on continental margins. And uh, the precipitation of these dissolved minerals out of water to form these hydrogen sediments is very slow. Um, some of the slowest chemical reactions known to occur on Earth. And finally, we have our fourth type of sediment, which is cosmogenous sediment. These are sediments that originate from space. They're very rare. And so whenever we have fragments from outer space coming into Earth's atmosphere, the friction uh, of the falling object with the atmosphere causes heat, which melts the material. And then as the material re-solidifies, it takes the shape of a sphere or an ellipsoid. And uh, we call these things tektites. And most of the cosmogenous sediment we find are these little tiny tektites called micro-tektites, which you can see here. Okay, so this is the, uh, the, the, the most rare type of sediment found in the ocean. So most marine sediments are some combination of the two most abundant, uh, that's pterogenous and biogenous sediments. And different marine environments, they have different characteristic sediments. And so because different environments have different characteristic sediments, uh, sediment uh, sediments record a record of past and present conditions in those environments. So as the environment may change throughout time, different types of sediments in that environment will be deposited, in that location will be deposited, and that uh, record of de deposited sediments can give us information about how that environment has changed throughout time. So we also can group sediments based upon where they are deposited. Our first group is called, are called neuritic sediments. And neuritic sediments are those sediments that are deposited on continental margins. And neuritic sediments are usually a different quantity, character, and composition than uh, those sediments deposited on the deep ocean floor. Uh, neuritic sediments, as you might guess, are mostly pterogenous sediments sense because we would expect a lot of land-derived sediment to be deposited on the continental margins. Okay, so Nordic sediments are those sediments, ocean sediments, deposited on the continental margins and they're mostly pterogenous sediments. The other type of sediment is known as pelagic sediments and these are sediments deposited on the deep sea floor. They're usually smaller in size than Nordic sediments and unlike uh, Nordic sediments that are mostly pterogenous, pelagic sediments are mostly biogenous sediments. So this also makes sense too because the further from land we go, the less land-derived materials we have and the more organic materials, though, or not necessarily organic, uh, the more uh, materials we have that are produced by organisms in the open ocean. So biogenous sediments are the most common type of pelagic sediments. In this map, we have the depth of sediments plotted. Uh, and so the depth is represented by the color. So blue indicates a thickness of zero meters. And the dark red represents a thickness of 20,000 meters, which is 20 kilometers, okay, which is uh, pretty, pretty, pretty thick. And we see that sediment is piled most thickly on the continental margins. And if you remember, what we just said is that the most common type of neuritic sediment, sediments deposited on the continental margins, are pterogenous sediments. So we can see that pterogenous sediments are piled very, very thickly on the continental margins. So we have these very thick neuritic sediment depositions, which are composed of pterogenous materials, where in the open ocean, which we learned are mostly biogenous sediments, we can see that they're piled very thinly. And so we could see that, that, that biogenous sediments do cover the majority of the sea floor, these deep ocean floors, these abyssal plains, but they're piled, piled very thinly. While these pterogenous sediments, they cover a small portion of the sea floor, mostly just the continental margins, but they're piled very thickly. To the point where, even though pterogenous sediments cover such a small portion of the uh, seafloor, they're still the most abundant sediment because they're 
piled so thickly. And even though biogenous sediment covers the majority of the seafloor, it's piled so thinly that it's uh, it's the second, still the second most abundant sediment, uh, second to terrigenous sediments. So this graph shows us what we are looking at. I'm going to graph this chart. There, this is the region. So we have continental shelves, slopes, and rises, and together these make the continental margin. This is the continental margin. And then this this last column, that's basically the abyssal plains. So these are neuritic sediments. These ones right here. Neuritic. Oh. And that's not what I want. Neuritic. And these are, once again, that's not what I want. Pelagic sediments, okay? And so you see that the percentage of the ocean area that is uh, that the continental margins makes up is a very small percentage of the total area, where the deep ocean floor, which is mostly the abyssal plains, makes up the vast majority of the sea floor surface. And here we have the percent of the total volume of marine sediments deposited at each of these locations. And so between the continental shelves, slopes, and rises, which together comprise the continental margins, we have 15 plus 41, that's 56, plus another 31, that's 87% of all sediments, all marine sediments, not pterogenous, not biogen, but all marine sediments are deposited on the continental margins, are deposited on 12%, sorry, 22% of the seafloor. Okay, so 87% of all marine sediments are deposited on 12%, uh, I'm not saying 12, 22% of the seafloor, while 13% of marine sediments are deposited on 78% of the seafloor. So these neuritic sediments are mostly, are mostly pterogeneous. So we have very thickly piled pterogenous sediment on a very small portion of the seafloor, the continental margins. And we have very thinly piled biogenous sediment on the vast majority of the ocean floor, 78%. And there you can see that uh, in order for pterogenous sediments to be the most abundant type of sediment, but yet cover the smallest percentage of the seafloor, they must be piled very thickly and you see here they are indeed. So we have the average thickness of these sediments, continental shelves 1.6 miles, continental slopes 5.6 miles, and the rises 5 miles. So we have very thick accumulations of, ter of, of pterogenous sediments on these continental margins, while the pelagic sediments, which are mostly biogenous, are piled very thinly. So sediment sorting. So se uh, sediments deposited on the continental margins, that is, neuritic sediments, are often sorted. Uh, sorted in the sense that larger grains are deposited closer to the coast, while smaller grains are deposited further from close, from further from the coast, closer to the shelf break. And this is because larger grains settle out of the water more quickly than smaller grains do, as we saw. Uh, several slides back. So the smaller the particle sediment, the slower it, it settles out of the water, and because it takes longer for it to settle out of the water, it's able to be transported by the water further from shore, where large particles of sediment like boulders and cobbles, they sink very quickly and they are deposited close to shore. Disruptions to the sorting does occur, so if the coastline itself changes, uh, due to changes to sea level, that sorting will be uh, will be disrupted, and glacial deposits. So glaciers can uh, push sediments further out to sea, and then you can have what's called ice rafted sediments, where sediments uh, are trapped in uh, icebergs that float and melt and slowly deposit. As they melt, the sediments are released and deposit in the sea floor. 
and we have these things called turbidity currents, which we talked about you know, when we talked about um, uh, ocean basins. These turbidity currents are these currents that flow along the sea floor on continental margins, and they transport sediment with them. They flow over the continental shelf and then over the break and down the continental slope, and they often take neuritic sediments from uh, the shelf and transport those neuritic sediments and make them pelagic sediments. They take those pterogenous sediments on the shelf and transport them down and deposit them on the uh, deep ocean floor, making those pterogenous sediments now pelagic sediments. So one way in which the uh, sorting of neuritic sediments is disrupted is changes in sea level. So for example, you know that the largest particles of sediment are, are deposited closest to the shore and they get progressively smaller as you go further from the coastlines. They get smaller and smaller to very tiny particles. Okay, But say if the sea levels change, say in, in, the, in the future, sea levels are much higher, so it's a sea level here, then larger particles of sediment will be de being deposited on this new coastline over here, and then smaller and smaller and smaller as we go over. And if sea levels lower in the future, then those in the sea levels in the future are right here, then sediments will be larger sediments will be deposited near the coast and then smaller as you go seaward. So depending on where the coastline is, that tells you where the sorting begins, where the largest sediments will be deposited. And um, because that's where the coast is. And we know that sea levels have changed drastically throughout the past. So this is uh, down here in this lower right corner a graph showing uh, historic sea levels. This is the height above or below present day sea levels in meters on this y-axis and in feet on this y-axis. And this is years before present. So you can see that sea levels have been rising uh, in, in recent history, but if you go further back, uh, about 125,000 years ago, sea levels are actually higher than they are today. So this sorting of, of neurotic sediments, uh, it changes. It's disrupted, I should say, by the changes in sea level. And so right now, we have the largest particles of sediment being deposited near the coastline, getting progressively smaller as you go out. But during the peak last ice age, the shoreline was right near the shelf break, actually. And so then, you, when it, this was the coastline, you had the largest sediments being deposited here. They got progressively smaller as you moved down. So if we would go out to this location, the sea floor, we'd find very small particles of sediment being deposited there now, but underneath them we can find larger particles of sediment that were deposit, deposited there whenever this was close to the shoreline during the last ice age. So. Uh, so that's one way we could see how the environment has changed throughout time, as we suggested before, by the size of sediment following the sorting of sediment on, on these continental margins of these neurotic sediments. So sediments can accumulate, as we talked about, to impressive thicknesses over time, especially on the continental shelves. And if enough sediment accumulates, and sediments near the bottom are under a lot of pressure and they undergo a process called lithification in which they turn into consolidated rock, known as sedimentary rock. And here you can see this is a picture in the lower right of the Grand Canyon. And all these different layers of rock are different layers of sedimentary rock. And these are marine sedimentary rocks. Sedimentary rocks that are uh, formed from marine sediments, sediments deposited on the sea floor. So yes, that's correct. These sediments, these sedimentary rocks, were formed by sediments deposited on a sea floor, which tells us that 
this was at one point in time a sea floor. So the, all this rock has been exposed by the Colorado River carving out this canyon. But this feature is called the Colorado Plateau, uh, this area where it's a very flat surface, and the Colorado River has just gouged down into this plateau, exposing all these layers of sedimentary rock. And each layer of sedimentary rock, rock was, at, was at one time the sea floor, the, the top layer of sediment on the sea floor. And so we have a vast record of what was going on in this ancient sea by, uh, through these sedimentary rocks. And we have fossils of marine organisms in these sedimentary rocks, so we can see how life evolved over time as well. And to give you an example of how drastic things can change, geologically speaking, this is Mount Everest right here. And the peak of Mount Everest is made up of limestone. Now, limestone is a marine sedimentary rock. It forms on sh warm, shallow oceans uh, where that calcareous ooze, which is a biogenous sediment, accumulates and eventually lithifies. So isn't that something? That the highest point of elevation on Earth currently is composed of a marine sedimentary rock, a rock that formed on the seafloor. So how did it get up there? Well, that seafloor was destroyed subduction zone and in between India and uh, Eurasia and some of the while it was subducting some of that sea floor the sediments and sedimentary rocks were scraped up onto the overriding plate then there were India collided with Eurasia forming the Himalayas some of that stuff that was scraped up off of the subducting oceanic plate onto the overriding plate was thrusted up as these mountains were formed and that limestone now sits on top of point of elevation on Earth. And so here we have uh, three different locations in the Colorado Plateau. We have Bryce Canyon National Park, which is located right there in Utah, uh, Zion National Park right here in Utah, and Grand Canyon National Park in Arizona. And you can see the sedimentary rocks in Bryce Canyon. You can see all these different bands of rocks. They're marine sedimentary rocks. We have sandstones, we have shale, sandstone is lithified sand, shale is lithified mud, and then we have limestones. Limestone is lithified calcareous ooze. Remember calcareous ooze is uh, the accumulation of those little tiny exoskeletons of plankton. It's a type of biogenous set of... Well, we have a, we see all these exposed layers of sedimentary rock exposed by erosion in Bryce Canyon. And the older, oldest exposed rocks in Bryce Canyon are the same as the youngest exposed rocks in Zion National Park. And so here we see where the, where the rocks here aren't exposed to look at, they are exposed here in Zion. So the, the record picks up at this location, and we can see the oldest exposed rocks at Zion are equivalent to the youngest exposed rocks at the Grand Canyon. And so using these three locations together, we can get pretty good record of what happened in this ancient seafloor for the past almost 500 million years. And to give you an idea, complex animals uh, really have only been around for a little more than 500 million years. So it's the sedimentary rocks in the Colorado Plateau, those three locations, that we've learned a lot about uh, evolution of marine organisms, starting from invert little tiny invertebrates into uh, vertebrates fish, and then from fish to more complex vertebrates. And so these sedimentary rocks tell us a lot about how the marine environment itself has changed, sea levels rose and fell, rose and fell, rose and fell with climate change, and how life itself has changed in the ocean through recording records of fossils, of the evolving life in the ocean. So. Uh, sediments that are being deposited on the ocean today are contain a wealth of knowledge about what's going on, but also sediments that were deposited in the ocean for yesterday, or you know, metaphorically for in the past, that are preserved as sedimentary rocks still act as a record for what was going on in ancient oceans a long time ago, hundreds of millions of years ago. So now, 
uh, those sediments that were that formed sedimentary rock, most of them are are neritic sediments, like sandstones, which is uh, sand shale, which is forms of mud and calcareous ooze from uh, from uh, the remains of this phytoplankton. Looking at pelagic sediments, uh, they can vary in composition and thickness. So, for example, in the Atlantic Ocean Basin, the average thickness of pelagic sediments is around a kilometer, while in the Pacific, the average thickness is around half of a kilometer. Why the discrepancy? The Atlantic is fed by more rivers that are transporting sediment into the basin, so there's a larger influx of sediment into the Atlantic Basin. Also, the Atlantic is smaller in area, so those sediments have a smaller surface area to accumulate on, so therefore they accumulate uh, to a thicker depth. And finally, sediments in the Pacific get trapped in the ocean trenches of the subduction zones around the edge of the Pacific, where there's not really that much subduction around the edge of the Atlantic Ocean Basin. And so, uh, and then pelagic sediments are the thickest on the abyssal plain and thinnest or absent on oceanic ridges. And why this is, is because the sea floor near the ocean ridges is the youngest sea floor. It just recently formed, so it hasn't had a lot of time to accumulate sediments. Whereas you go further away from the ocean ridges onto the abyssal plains, that sea floor is older, older, and older. Because it was formed at that ridge at one point in time, it was spread away from the ridge. So the sea floor on the abyssal plains is much older, and therefore has more, had, had more time to accumulate sediments, and thus has thicker sediment depositions. So we can have some um, larger particle sediments, um, so not just fine particle sediments that are on the deep sea floor, and those are brought down by turbidity currents. And so turbidity currents, which are mixtures of sediment and water that periodi periodically rush down the conical slope. Uh, these currents are driven by gravity, and they deposit these graded layers of heterogeneous uh, sand in a bit of finer pelagic sediments on the deep sea floor. So what that means is you can have these turbidity currents flow down and deposit some heterogeneous sediment on the deep sea floor. Then on top of that, you can have some finer pelagic um, sediments accumulate just uh, naturally. And then you have another turbidity current, which will deposit some coarser pterogeneous sediment on top of that, creating this layered structure of, of coarse pterogeneous, finer pelag uh, pelagic, uh, which might be biogenous, and this coarse pterogeneous, and this finer biogenous. And these alterations of coarse pterogeneous and fine biogenous sediment depositions near the edges of continents are known as turbididites. These are these sediment depositions uh, produced by turbidity currents. Clays. Clays are a type of pterogeneous sediment that's found on the deep sea floor, so they're considered to be pelagic. So 38% of the deep sea bed is covered by clays or other fine pterogenous particles. And because these particles are so small, they have a very, very small settling velocity. So it takes a long time for them to settle to the sea floor, and so they're able to be transported far distances from the land. And so clays are really the only type of pterogenous sediment that's uh, pelagic, because all other pterogenous sediments settle out of the water before they can tra be transported far from the coast, so they end up being deposited on the continental margins and are therefore neritic and not pelagic. So the accumulation of these pelagic clays can be extremely slow, as slow as two millimeters every thousand years. So the other type of pelagic sediment, which is the most abundant type of pelagic sediment, is these oozes, okay, biological oozes. And these oozes are formed from the remains of living creatures. Any deep sea sediment that contains at least 30% biogenous material is, is considered to be one of these biogenous oozes. So organisms that generate these oozes are these small, single cellular organisms. They're plankton. Okay, and uh, the uh, there's these lar and there's larger organisms that eat them, 
these little tiny animals, and both the the uh, photosynthetic plankton and the animal plankton, they make these little tiny hard shells. Okay, so they're hard shells and the skeleton remains of these organisms. They're either composed of silica or calcium carbonate. And when they die, those little silica or calcium carbonate structures, they settle to the sea floor and accumulate, forming oozes. And uh, silica-rich oozes are known as siliceous oozes, while oozes containing a lot of calcium carbonate are known as calcareous oozes. And oozes accumulate very slowly as well. They accumulate from 1 to 6 centimeters for every 1,000 years. Here we have a picture of uh, foraminiferin. So this is a type of siliceous uh, phytoplankton. So these little tiny structures are made of silica, and they accumulate in the seafloor, forming siliceous ooze. Well, over here we have coccoliths, which are these little plates of coccolithophores, which are a type of calcareous phytoplankton. So phytoplankton make these little calcareous structures. So whenever uh, they die, these structures settle and accumulate in the seafloor, uh, forming calcareous oozes. These are the white chalk cliffs of Dover in England. And you can see this cliff is made of this nice white rock. You can see these little people down here for a scale. And this is limestone. And limestone is formed by, by, uh, from lithified calcareous ooze. So this rock, this cliff of rock, is made out of those little tiny exoskeletons of phytoplankton that lived in an ancient ocean that used to exist here. It's hard to believe, but that is the case. And this cliff is about 100 meters, about 100 meters tall. Okay, and if that cliff is 100 meters tall, and let's say they accumulate as slow as well, one centimeter per thousand years, a centimeter, one centimeter is zero point, oh, point zero one meter every thousand years. You can tell I'm really good at writing with this pen. Then that we can do this multiplication and find out how long roughly it took for this to accumulate. We take 100 times 1,000 and divide by 1 one hundredth, we get 10 million years. So it took around 10 million years for this to accumulate. So this was an ancient sea floor that was accumulating calcareous ooze for about 10 million years. Now this, this, this stuff is all around us because we use limestone all the time. And limestone, remember, is just these little tiny calcareous phytoplankton. Uh, we use limestone, we crush it up to make cement. We use uh, limestone to make chalk. So chalk is nothing but calcium carbonate. So yes, chalk is these little tiny phytoplankton lithified calcareous oozes, tums, yeah, as in tum, 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 tum. Yeah, that's calcium carbonate, so that's little tiny phytoplankton as well. What makes your toothpaste white? Calcium carbonate. If you look at the ingredients, it's these little tiny calcareous phytoplankton. So we have a lot of uses for these ancient biogenous deposits, these calcareous oozes. These calcareous oozes do not accumulate in all parts of the seafloor. Uh, there's a certain depth known as the calcium carbonate compensation depth, uh, shortened as the CCD, that below that depth, calcareous oozes do not accumulate. Okay, so the CCD is usually around 4,500 meters deep. And what happens is below those depths, the water is colder. 
well, it's cool enough that it can, 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 can hold an amount of dissolved carbon dioxide that, uh, that results in an acidity of the water that's too high for calcareous um, sediment to remain solid. It dissolves in the more acidic water. So why does CO2 have anything to do with acidity? Whenever you dissolve carbon dioxide in water, it forms carbonic acid. So the more CO2 dissolved in water, the more carbonic acid in the water, the more acidic the water. And cooler liquids can hold more dissolved gases, so these cooler deep sea waters hold more dissolved CO2 and are therefore more acidic. And these more acidic waters dissolve the calcium carbonate so it doesn't accumulate as a solid. And so this forms kind of what's called a marine snow line, that above a certain depth you have the accumulation of calcareous ooze because the water is warm enough that it doesn't have that much CO2 dissolved in it, so it's not its its acidity is low enough that calcium carbonate can accumulate, or below the CCD, it's too cold, or the water is too acidic, and the calcium carbonate dissolves. So about 48% of the surface of the deep ocean basin is covered by calcareous ooze. So that's a large portion, almost half, and so that means the rest of the seafloor is either deeper or closer to the poles, like the Arctic or the Antarctic, where the water is just much cooler overall, then uh, calcium carbonate can't deposit at any depth because the water is cool enough at all depths that it's too acidic for the calcium carbonate to accumulate. So if this calcareous ooze accumulates at warmer, at shallower, warmer sea floors, then what dominates at the cooler, deeper sea floors is the siliceous ooze. So the siliceous oozes, which is formed by the remains, accumulation of the remains of phytoplankton that make their exoskeletons out of silica, they dominate at the greater depths, the, the very deep ocean floors, and they dominate at the polar regions, okay? Both locations where the water is much cooler, therefore has more CO2 in it, and therefore is more acidic. We also remain we also mine their fossil remains for economic uses. These little tiny siliceous exoskeletons, uh, we, we use them in, in uh, polishes. They're mild abrasive. We also use them in our toothpaste as well. So toothpaste is just full of uh, ancient phytoplankton. Uh, they, these little silica structures, they help abrase our teeth when we're brushing them, they help clean them. And also, uh, the most common type of siliceous ooze is, is formed by these organisms called diatoms. And so uh, we mine the siliceous oozes and we, and we market it as diatomaceous earth. And what we do is they use these as a, an insect exterminant or these little tiny structures. They wedge themselves in between the segments of an insect's body and kill the insect. And so people will put diatomaceous earth in their garden to kill uh, pest insects and they even put diatomaceous earth which is little tiny phyto uh, little tiny siliceous phytoplankton in um, grain uh, storage areas like grain silos to keep insects at bay to kill insects and so they sell food grade diatomaceous earth to put in with stored grains to uh, kill insects so now whenever so whenever we eat grain products like bread, cereals, that grain was stored somewhere with diatomaceous earth. So we're all eating this stuff pretty much every day. Don't worry, it's not toxic. It's like, kind of like eating little little tiny fragments of glass, but they're extremely extremely small. So hydrogenous sediments they. Uh, uh, are materials that precipitate directly out of seawater itself. And they accumulate on the sea floor, and they're usually associated with pterogenous or biogenous sediments. They rarely form as sediments by themselves. And so they originate from these chemical reactions that occur on a particle of the dominant sediment. So say if the sea floor is mostly pterogenous sediment, then hydrogenous sediments form from dissolved materials precipitating out onto particles of pterogenous sediment. If the dominant sediment is biogenous sediment on that part of the seafloor, 
Well, then these hydrogen sediments form from dissolved materials precipitating out onto fragments or pieces of biogenous sediment. But for example, manganese nodules, they consist primarily of manganese, as the name would suggest, and iron oxide, which is rust. They contain other small amounts of metals, but the, they, their, their growth is not fully understand by marine chemists because uh, it occurs so slowly. So their growth uh, occurs at a rate of around 1 to 10 millimeters per million years, which is ridiculously slow. But, say like the oldest oceanic lithosphere in the Atlantic Ocean Basin is 180 million years old, that means that one of these manganese nodules, if it started to form real early, could be you know, 18 millimeters large, okay, uh, which is in diameter, um, yeah, diameter. So one of the slowest chemical reactions in nature. So phosphorite nodules grow a little bit faster, and they're found in shallower waters. Manganese nodules are found on deep sea floors, and one of the reasons why they form so slowly is because of the low temperatures. But uh, phosphorite nodules, which form on shallower uh, sea floors, especially continental margins, they form much, uh, they form more quickly than manganese nodules. But often these manganese nodules, uh, if you find one and break it apart, you'll see that it they it formed around say a, a shark's tooth or bits of bone or some microscopic algae or animal skeleton. So they usually form or nuclei on some other type of sediment might find a pebble or something in there. So here are some pictures of uh, manganese nodules. And so here's a field of manganese nodules. You can see there's some sediment dusted over them, but these little tiny things, these are manganese nodules on the deep sea floor. All right, that's it for ocean sediments. I hope that you enjoyed the lecture. And, uh, and I'll see you for our next lesson lecture, which will be on water. Thank you very much.